Good morning, everyone. New York City Parks Environmental Educator, Christopher Ricker here. And I wanna welcome you all to another Greenbelt at Home virtual program. We're just gonna wait a minute and let all of our patrons log on. We're really excited to be able to offer this awesome virtual program after the magical snow we've had here in the Greenbelt. And so, if this is your first time joining us for a virtual program here at the Greenbelt, welcome. If you are one of our regular patrons who either visits the park uh, in person to hike our 35 miles of trails, or you've been coming to our virtual programs over the past year, welcome back. And as I gingerly make my way through the snow, I see one of our environmental educators who will introduce today's program. So we're gonna flip over now. Hello everyone. Um, welcome to this edition of A Fine Patch of Wild, um, where myself, uh, Karen, and my coworker, Angel Ellers, are taking you on a journey through this amazing book that we have here. Um, this is our High Rock Park book. This is the older version. Um, you'll see later that Angel has the newer version. It's by John G. Mitchell and Mar Marbury Brown. Marbury Brown, sorry. Um, and this chapter is called Tracks. It's, uh, we've gone through the natural history of the park on the last two chapters, and this chapter is really more focused on the human impact and the human history of our park here. So you can see I am standing in front of our administration building. Um, we call this the Stone House because it's made out of these beautiful flagstones, I believe. Um, but it is also known as the Tonking House because that is the family that owned it at one point. Um, probably a farming house at some point and privately owned long before this was a park. Uh, so we're going to walk a little ways down our trail here and meet up with Angel. And she is going to read a nice ex excerpt out of the book. Yeah. You can see the beautiful snow. So most of our trails are covered in a good, let's say, foot of snow at least. So if you plan on coming out to our park, be prepared for that. Um, our park road is nicely plowed though. Good morning, everyone. Oh, good morning. Hi. How is everyone doing today? Very well. Yeah, me too. I'm really enjoying sitting here atop this hill and looking out onto the glistening water and the glistening snow. It's really beautiful. And a perfect place to be reading the third chapter of High Rock. And I have the special version, High Rock and the Green Belt, which has a special section after the first part of the book that talks about all of the different landmark locations in the park all throughout the 35 uh, miles of trails and such. Um, so this book is a little different than that one, but the book itself, the writings by John G. Mitchell are the same. So we're going to go and just start with this first part of the third chapter, Tracks. Unless Schoolcraft and other early scholars were mistaken, the local Indians, the Lene Lenape, did not care much for Staten Island. The Lenape called it Aquahanga Manaknan the place of the bad woods. And except for occasional hunting forays inland, prefer they preferred to stay near the shore, taking their protein from shellfish. What it was about the woods that bothered the Indians is anyone's guess. Bad spirits, possibly, or dark mythic tales from the edge of the council fire, or perhaps plain poor hunter's luck. Though the great spirit only knows how the Lenape tried, putting the torch to the forest here, and there to drive the game toward the waiting bowmen, or sometimes just burning a hole in the woods. Primitive wildlife managers that they were to improve the forage for deer. Or perhaps they became, they became disenchanted when they saw what the early Dutch settlers were up to. The Dutch, not to mention the Huguenots and the Walden scenes, 
who were skillful at burning charcoal were making manakna with axes in the tall timber. To what extent the Dutch addressed their axes to the forest of Toad Hill is beyond historical recall. It may have been that they were more interested at the time in its ore deposits. For history does recall that the Dutch referred to this promontory as Iron Hill. Later, or perhaps simultaneously, the prevailing word toad became associated with the hill as the result of unfriendly encounters here between Dutch and Indians, a dispute over mining and forestry practice, practices, possibly. Whatever the provocation, an unspecified number of Dutchmen perished in the argument so that toad or death hill came into popular usage. And I'm going to pause right there because there are quite a few parts of this chapter that I think are really beautiful to read. So I'm going to pause and we're going to continue walking along this trail, which is the Plaw Trail. And Karen will tell you a little more and then we'll stop, do a little more reading. So um, when you come up into High Rock Park, you cannot miss our red buildings like the one behind me. Um, these were Boy Scout buildings. Uh, as I had mentioned before, uh, the Tonking family owned this, and they were actually chicken farmers. Uh, they sold it to another farmer named Harry Bell, I believe his name is, or Ball. Um, and when he was kind of done using it as his, for farming, he actually wanted to do a horse farm. He sold it to the Boy Scouts uh, in 1944, and the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts had this property for quite some time, and they built these buildings. This is the pouch building, or the pouch laboratory, um, and we are going to be walking towards another building named Gypsy Hollow. So all the, all the buildings here have names. Um, the one we do most of our education out is the Roosevelt Lab, and our visitor's studio. So from up here in High Rock Park, you can see out to the water. Um, I don't know if you can capture that on the iPad because it's quite sunny and reflective, but you can see all the way to the water from here. I don't know if the viewers on Facebook Live can hear that woodpecker sound. Sounds almost like a creaking of a door. And it shows that even in the dead of winter, oh, there goes a red tail park, off to our right, that even in the dead of winter, on these really cold and snowy days, and even on some of the more like close to center and introductory trails, like the Paw Trail or the Red Dot Trail that you can reach just from the High Rock Park, park Road, um, that there's still so much rich wildlife to see if you're opening your eyes and paying good attention. And especially if we try to walk nice and slowly through nature, making our imprints as small and quiet as possible, then maybe some of the urban wildlife friends might not scurry away so quick quickly when we're coming through. We might actually catch a glimpse of them or at least be able to hear them. You did see that claw. So white paws inside of the red trail markers, they are meant to look like raccoon paws. Some of them might look a little bit more like human hands, as Karen and Chris and I painted them <laughs> this past autumn. We did our very best. So I can hear quite a few birds um, besides the woodpecker and 
One of the birds you'll probably see in the wintertime is something called the junco, which is, I believe, a type of sparrow. And you can tell them uh, right away because they have a little pink bill. They're gray and white. And they do love the snow. So I've been seeing them a bit around this park. So that's one of the winter birds that you'll definitely see um, when you come out and venture around High Rock. And you don't even have to go too far off the road to see them. If you can, just a little bit to the right, you'll see the diamond, or I'm sorry, the pyramid shape of the start of the red dot tail, which uh, we also just reblazed this past year. This trail, we believe, was originally a Boy Scout trail created by the Boy Scouts. Um, it's a really great trail. I'd say it's really super accessible because it's right off of the High Rock Park Road, but it is kind of a moderate difficulty hike, so it kind of has a little bit for everybody. And if you go down, it's just a loop trail, about a mile long, maybe a little bit less through the nice hills of the back of High Rock, which from what I've observed is not the most popular space. So if you're looking for a really nice socially distanced hike where you won't run into too many people, um, that's a really great chance to go down there. And we were going to film down at the bottom of that trail today. We were going to show you the um, Altamont ponds, which are natural kettle ponds from the time of the glacier. Um, also Altamont House, which was a house that was built when the Girl Scouts owned this property back before it was um, sold to the city. Um, really beautiful down there. So definitely worth your time to go explore down that way. And we're going to stand kind of still for just a few moments while I read the next part from the book. I am on page 25 of the new version of the book. If anybody out there has the book and wants to read along, that's where we are. So moving on in time, past the time when the Lenape lived here on Staten Island, this is where we're picking it up. It is unabashed speculation to suppose that Henry David Thoreau himself may once have made tracks across the High Rock perimeter. The proper historian bridling at conjecture would be inclined to say, how do you know that he did that? To which I, borrowing, borrowing a bit from Thoreau's own brand of feisty logic, would have to respond, how do you know that he didn't? What we do know, in any event, is that Thoreau came to Staten Island in 1843 and stayed a year or so to tutor the nephews of his Concord crony, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And from the snuggery, a little brown farmhouse at the foot of the hill, now bearing the Emerson name, Thoreau sallied forth from time to time to explore the island's wilder parts, notably the Great Marsh at Fresh Kills, where he spent at least one pleasant day on Lakes Island collecting arrowheads. Now certainly any sensible rambler setting forth from the quill would have followed the Richmond Plank Road, past Howe's old headquarters to Richmond Town, at the head of Fresh Kills. But was Thoreau a sensible rambler? I doubt it. I rather suspect Thoreau stayed away from the road, kept to the high ground from Emerson Hill south, then along the escarpment of Toad Hill, past the glacial ponds and through the woods on the hill's south shoulder, across Richmond Brook to Lighthouse Hill, to Ketchum Hill, and down into the marsh. Thoreau would have been the entire way in the kind of rough, tumbling country he preferred, give or take a few hundred years, such a course would surely have carried his tracks across High Rock. So as we're walking through our park here, we can see all these beautiful trees. Um, but this park um, in this area is known as the Second Growth Forest. And the reason for that is way back when um in 17 
1776, right around the Revolutionary War time, um, the British came and used a lot of our lumber here for their uh, camps and for whatever they might need, firewood, building homes. Um, there were quite a few sawmills on Staten Island at that time. And one of the notable ones um, probably was around Egbertville Ravine area, uh, was known as Connor's Sawmill. So Richard Connor was a businessman. He was also a politician. And when the British were here, they gave him, I guess, the privilege, maybe, to be one of the people who uh, would be tasked with cutting down the lumber and um, giving it to the British. So they cut down so many trees that this forest actually had to regrow at some point. So um, it's said in the book that they cut down 6,000 cords of tree trees. Um, and those trees consisted of oak, beech, birch, maple, cedar, and chestnut. So similar to some of the uh, trees that we still have existing here, um, but these are not quite as old as they would have been if we didn't cut all those trees down. So um, that deforestation continued all the way until the 1800s. And when Lang and Davis, who were notable um, naturalists, came to kind of study this area, they noted that there wasn't even one tree really that was over 50 years old. So this is a second growth forest. It did have to regrow after the British came and deforested this land. So it's pretty significant because it has shaped this entire park. Um, we're gonna keep on walking, talk a little bit more. So if we pan over to the right, I know Chris is going right now. We can start to see something that I'm just gonna draw your attention to as a focal point to introduce the next kind of topic because there are lots of neighbors to High Rock Park and the Greenbelt that can be seen really easily, maybe sometimes even accidentally ventured into. Um, and we know that just to our right here, and it is kind of um, bordered by the blue and the yellow trail, also by the red dot trail that we all already talked about, is Moravian Cemetery. So we're looking at one of the more notable monuments that Karen's gonna get to in a moment, and we're back. We are back in action. So hey technology, we're high up on a hill in the middle of winter and our iPad works most of the time. That's great. <laughs> so I'm just going to recap what I was just saying. Um, we're kind of looking in this general direction off the right side of the road at the um, land that is Moravian Cemetery. And Moravian Cemetery is the oldest and still active cemetery on all of Staten Island. Started in 1740, so that's, you know, almost 300 years, which is pretty remarkable. Um, the history that is laying in the soil of that cemetery. Um, it started out as 114 acres, I think, and then it added a few as some notable families in the area donated their land or sold it to the cemetery. So it's a little bit bigger than that, and it has some really notable names of Staten Islanders in there. Um, so we have Ellis Austin, famous photographer, female, lesbian, amazing artist and advocate, um, whose house is down in the kind of Stapleton, past Stapleton Clifton area. Um, we also have the tomb here, which Karen's gonna talk about. We have the DeVita family, that's my family. My grandma and grandpa, Julie and Frank, are buried in Moravian Cemetery. We know that Martin Scorsese's parents are buried there, and then he actually has his plot already prepared and bought for when his time comes. And then finally, we have um, John Faber. So Faber has his own park, a New York City park, in um, kind of Port Richmond area, Richmond Terrace. And he was the person who made the Faber pencils and had a museum down there. So he's in this cemetery also.
So we're trying to get a really good view of the Vanderbilt mausoleum, which you can see from our park road on a winter day like this. You can't really see it too much in the summer when the leaves are there, but you can see it from the road today. Um, so this section of Moravian Cemetery is owned by the Vanderbilt family. Uh, the Vanderbilts, uh, it really started with Cornelius Vanderbilt, who was a pretty smart businessman, started a ferry service between New York and, uh, sorry, Manhattan and Staten Island. And he was smart enough to undercut most of his competitors, and he pretty much ruled that, uh, that field. So with that, he actually became very rich. He ended up buying railroads and was one of the richest men that ever have lived, uh, like, you know, the Bill Gates and the Elon Musks of the time. Uh, so when he passed away, his son purchased this land and they built a mausoleum for him and most of the men in the family. Around the main tomb, you'll see uh, the daughters. There is one tomb called Sloan. There's also a street named Sloan, and that was one of the daughters, I believe. Um, in this part of the cemetery, I know you might have heard of Gloria Vanderbilt, who just passed away recently. That's Anderson Cooper's mother. They are also buried here um, and the rest of that family. So it's pretty interesting to see the types of people that lived here on Staten Island and made a difference. If you do ever get a chance to visit this portion of the cemetery, I think this Moravian does do tours once in a while. I don't know what they're, they're doing right now with COVID. Um, but the artwork in that section of the, the cemetery is quite amazing. The stonework, I should say, it's truly beautiful. And, uh, you know, the Vanderbilt tomb is the size of a house. So it's pretty impressive to see. The size of a very impressive house. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> a really big house. Big. <laughs> a huge house. Yeah. And from what I heard, there's still some vacancies in there. <laughs> is I, there? Yeah. I went on a, a forgotten cemeteries talk several years ago and they talked a lot about Vanderbilt's tomb and there's still, still space in there. Yeah, Unfortunately there. it has succumbed to some vandalism so they've had to close up the front doors with some steel doors but uh, otherwise it's pretty pretty interesting to see. We have a little nest above us. I don't know if you guys can oh, see yeah. this little nest right above us which is a great time to come and see the nests that were made in the summer because there aren't any leaves on the trees. Yeah, winter is just about the only time. I remember um, walking around here at the end of last winter, seeing so many different nests and spotting different really huge, impressive birds of prey. And then as spring was coming and we we're all so happy that the warmth was coming, so were all the leaves from the trees, and it dawned on me that it would be more difficult to see that in the spring. So with the change of season comes a change of what you are able to observe with ease in parks, and it's really exciting all year round. As long as it's safe and accessible, then come on down. And we're seeing a lot of wildlife coming back to Staten Island, and especially here in our park. And that's due to some conservation efforts that have been put forward throughout the years to try and undo the things like the deforestation and um, maybe overdevelopment. So it's really great that we still have this park here intact and uh, no one decided to build houses on it. But that's another chapter in the book, right? <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> if we're about ready for our closing remarks, yep. I was going to read the last two paragraphs of this chapter because it's really amazing how things advanced from the beginning of this third chapter to the end. So I think this is a perfect time to jump fast forward to the 1930s. <laughs> so in the 1930s, before these final acquisitions, the scouts had called their original land short-term camp, meaning one camp there for one or two nights only. Lean-tos were erected and lodges one Bunton Lodge was totally destroyed by a fire in 1943. And before long, the camp's directors were counting off 75,000 75, overnighters a year. The camp, uh, the camp attracted the support of wealthy local benefactors, Nathan Orbach and Thomas Watson Jr. and William Pouch. 
and through the long post-war summers, the blue haze of wood smoke drifted lazily through the treetops, and the clatter of cook pans echoed across the shallow ponds and down the steep slopes and out among the gravestones of the Moravian greensward. And then, one fine day, on a drawing board in some faraway office, a highway en engineer traced a thin blue line, two in fact, since every highway requires a right-of-way, across a map of Toad Hill. The parallel lines curved gracefully, like the blade of a scythe, through the blank spaces of the old Middletown forest, from Ocean Terrace along the ridgetop and down the, the tumbling south shoulder to Richmond Brook, the path Thoreau may have taken, that Olmsted must surely have followed to speak so highly of a linear park. And in its sweep, the dual line bisected the scout camp, severing some 60 acres from the larger body of the property, lopping off the parcels once owned by Tonking and Vanderbilt and Ebbett and Flagg. The Richmond Parkway, the people at the drawing boards would call their little blue lines, and in the boardrooms of the Boy Scouts, the men who must react to such decisions shook their heads in sadness and in resignation and agreeing it would be wise to retain the larger northern element of the camp, voted to sell the smaller part, the locked off part, to their distaff colleagues in the Girl Scouts Council of Greater New York. The price was $35,000, which may have seemed, seemed like a lot at the time, for the time was 1951. In any event, the Girl Scout leaders were delighted to have a camp at least within the boundaries of New York City. And then I suspect that they were delighted as well to hear through the Scout grapevine that an energetic camping consultant from Needham, Massachusetts had just moved with her husband, Horace Moulton, to a white frame house on the Eastern Escarpment of Toad Hill. So we have a little junco sitting in the middle of our road. A couple of them behind us. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> All right. So thank you for joining us today. Um, we will be back again next month with the next chapter. And if you would like to see any of our other virtual um, programs, you can go to our, our website, which is sigreenbelt.org. Check out our YouTube channel, the Staten Island Greenbelt, or Join us again on Facebook, either on our Greenbelt Conservancy page or our Greenbelt Environmental Education page. So we'll see you soon.